Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I trust that everybody had a good afternoon. It was pretty pleasant out despite the wind. So hopefully you've been able to enjoy the sunshine in some wonderful way this weekend before you get back to work on Monday. <clears throat> the very first psalm speaks of how blessed an individual is who delights in God's Word. And the word blessed means happy in that passage. In fact, as you read the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, as you read Psalm chapter 1, the word blessed means happy. And taking this one step further, we should be happy not only when an individual follows the Lord in God's ways, but when a couple follows the Lord together. Um, and so I want to think with you about the fact that God wants happy couples. He wants happy marriages. We've been studying downstairs about rock-built marriage. That's marriage that's built on Jesus Christ and His Word. And uh, we got cut short a lesson. So I told everybody, because the new quarter started and we didn't get our last lesson in, I'd go ahead and preach about it tonight. So this will be for the benefit of everyone here this evening. Um, God wants us, in Proverbs 5 and verse 18, He says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. God wants us to be happy in marriage. He wants us rejoicing in marriage. Um, and in this lesson, I want to consider a few words of advice from God's Word that can help contribute to a happy marriage. I want to notice with you, first of all, that I believe a happy marriage, as taught in Scripture, needs a spiritual foundation. Marriage cannot thrive on just physical and material things. Because if the physical and material things run out, what's going to happen to your marriage? Um, marriages can't thrive on emotional experience. You know, that, that idea that I've got a butterflies in the stomach feeling towards my spouse, and I, can, I know I love them because I can feel it. I hope you feel it. And, and I hope that you're emotional about that. But there's going to be some point in life where you look over at your spouse, and it's been a really bad day, and they've had a really bad day, and they're older, and things are tough, and that butterflies in the stomach feeling is non-existent. Um, it's not there. Not to say it can't come back, but every once in a while it's going to disappear. And if your marriage is built on this emotional experience, this Hollywood-esque uh, music playing in the background, beautiful artistic scenery, that type of vibe, uh, then your, your marriage is on, on, on a risky plane. Because when that vibe's not there, things might get tough. Our homes need to be built on the Lord. Psalm 127 and verse 1, Psalm 127 and verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord builds the home, you're laboring in vain. You're, you're, you're building a house on a sand foundation. How does the Lord build the house? Well, for one, you need to know the Lord's Word. 2 Timothy 3.16 uh, says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, and for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. When your marriage is built on God, it's going to be built on His Word. And His Word is going to correct you in your marriage. It's going to guide you in your marriage. Um, it's, it's, it's going to help you in your marriage. 2 Peter 1.3 says that um, He's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Jesus gives us everything we need to live out our life and to be godly. One author wrote, What is a home without a Bible? Tis a home where day is night, starless night, for o'er life's pathway, heaven can shed no kindly light. What is a home without a Bible? Tis a home where daily bread for the body is provided, but the soul is never fed. What is a home without a Bible? Tis a family out at sea, compass lost and rudder broken, drifting, drifting thoughtlessly. Uh, with this in mind, each couple should devote private 
and daily time together in the Word. And here's what's going to happen when you do that. For one, you're going to enhance your spiritual relationship. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Your spiritual relationship with God and with each other is going to improve when you are studying the Word together, thinking about it together. It's going to give you sure counsel because sometimes we have ideas about what we should be doing in our marriage roles, what we should be doing even in, in things outside of marriage but that affect our marriage partners. And we may very well be wrong. God's Word gives us sure counsel. Uh, when you can be sure that God's Word is guiding your decisions and your choices and what you're doing in life, you've got a sure counselor. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. It's going to assist you in spiritual battles. You're going to face battles in your life on a spiritual level. And when you're grounded in God's Word, when you know God's Word, it's going to help you in facing those battles. Jesus, when He was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, in Matthew chapter 4, every time He's tempted, in these three times, three temptations the devil gives Him. He says, turn this, this stone into bread if you're hungry. He tells Him, go, go, go just bow down and worship Me, and I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of this world. Jump off of the pinnacle of this temple, and if you do, your angels are going to catch you. Um, three times He offers those temptations, and Jesus every time says, it is written. Jesus knew Scripture, and having Scripture in His heart helped Him to overcome the temptations of the devil. It assisted Him in spiritual battle, and it will do the same for us when we are faced with temptation in our marriage. And those temptations can come in a variety of ways. Ephesians 6 and verse 10 says, My brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You've got to put on God's armor. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's not we're wrestling against, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. One of the ways the devil knows that he can attack you and your faith is if he attacks you and your marriage. The devil's working and devil will work to try to break up and destroy and uh, cause problems in your home and your marriage. He says, in order to fight that, combat that, you've got to take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. So stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. You've got to know the truth. Put it on the breastplate of righteousness. You've got to be someone who is following the ways of righteousness, shot in your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Being a peacemaker, using the gospel to be a peacemaker, taking the shield of faith, Faith, faith that is revealed in God's Word, so that you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and don't forget prayer, uh, so that you can persevere and be supplied with what you need. That's going to help assist you in spiritual battle, battles in your marriage. It's going to help maintain spiritual health. Hebrews 5 and verse 12. Hebrews 5 and verse 12. Hebrew. The writer of Hebrews says in verse 12, By this time you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. We want to be stronger. We want to grow in our discernment. And that's really what this is about. He says, Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He is a babe. God wants you to grow beyond being just a babe in Christ, knowing just the very basics. He says, Solid food, that's meat, spiritual meat. He says that belongs to those who are of full age, those who are mature. God wants you to grow in your maturity in the faith. Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The more familiar you get with the word, the more discerning you get as to what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong. And the stronger you get in the word, the stronger you get in resisting temptation and overcoming, um, overcoming sin. That's going to help your marriage. It's going to help you maintain spiritual health. And you know what that's going to require? It's going to require you making time. If you're going to study the Bible with each other, you've got to make time for it. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God. And Luke 10, there was Martha and Mary gathered around Jesus there. One of them's in the kitchen, and the other one's sitting at his feet. And Jesus praises the one who takes time away from the kitchen and sits down at his feet so she can learn more about his word. She had to make time.
Jesus praises the one who makes time. We've got busy, busy lives. And maybe that's one of the ways the devil's attacking us is he's trying to keep us so busy we don't have time for the word. We've got to make time for it. It's going to help you build that spiritual foundation. And here's going to be the benefits if you'll build that. Build that spiritual foundation in your marriage. A couple is going to reap several spiritual benefits from studying together. God's word does not ever return back void. It's going to make you stronger. Here's one of the first benefits it gives us. It gives us assurance. It gives us assurance that we're not alone. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. In this last chapter of Hebrews, verse 5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with what you have. For God himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? When you study the scriptures and when you're familiar with the scriptures, you always know that you've got a helper, a comforter, an encourager. And that's God who is with you and helps you fight your battles. And God's word assures us of that as we read the scriptures. It assures us that he's helping us in our marriage and he's going to help us do what's right. Second, it assists us in living faithfully. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So it assists us, knowing the scriptures, having a spiritual foundation, strengthens and assists us to do God's work. Uh, it also helps aim us, points us in the right direction, uh, gets our mind focused on spiritual things, not material, not petty things, Gets us focused together on spiritual things. Colossians chapter 3 says, If you were raised with Christ, he's talking to people who are baptized here. People who had confessed their faith in Christ. They've been raised up out of the waters of baptism. Now they are walking in newness of life. And he says, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. If Christ is everything to you, if that's what's most important in your life, if going to heaven is the most important thing, then he says, seek it. Live for it. Set your mind on things above, not on things above on the earth. Don't be focused on earthly things. Having a spiritual foundation points us in the right direction. Um, I'm not always going to be here with my wife on this earth. She is either going to pass, I'm going to pass, who knows, maybe we'll both pass at the same time, I don't know, but the one place I know we can be together forever, for eternity is in heaven. It's the same for my kids, it's going to be the same for my grandkids, one place where I can be with my family forever is in heaven. And that's where I want to aim and steer them. It's there. Um, this world isn't my home, so I don't want to live for this world. I want to live for heaven. And having a spiritual foundation reminds us of that, especially if we're being reminded on a daily basis of those things. There's a lot of other good things, a lot of other good benefits we could talk about, but uh, let's move to the second point here. It's important for us, if we're going to have a happy marriage, have a spiritual foundation. It, it assures us, it assists us, it aims us. There's emotional security there. I would offer to you, secondly, it's also important for us, if we're going to have a happy marriage, to have a healthy physical relationship. If you read the scriptures, you read that from the very beginning, God created man and woman as sexual beings. Genesis chapter 2. God created the man, and then he sees that the man needs a helper. He creates woman. The two became one flesh. And it says that when they were joined together as one flesh, they were naked and they weren't ashamed. We see very quickly they begin procreating and having children in that relationship. But such a relationship was considered good by God. And it was encouraged. There was nothing wrong with that relationship. There was no reason to be ashamed in a marriage relationship with Adam and Eve. And so it has been with every married couple since then. It's a good relationship. Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says that the, the marriage bed is undefiled in uh, the, the marriage relationship. Uh, so sexual intimacy in marriage is good in Hebrews 13 and verse 4. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's something, in fact, that um, is to be enjoyed. That's really what Proverbs 5 is all about. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. And then it gets a lot more specific about how you do that rejoicing. And one of those things is that physical relationship, as we called it in an earlier sermon, marital recreation, um, which <clears throat> is the, the nice way of saying it in an audience with small children. Um, it is good. It is for pleasure. The marriage relationship is for pleasure. Proverbs chapter 5, 
verses 15 through 20. Uh, just, let's go ahead and just read that, that context there. I should call on someone to read this. It'd be kind of funny. Proverbs 5, verse 15. Drink water from your own well and running water from, or drink water from your own sister and running water from your own well. What's he talking about there? Enjoy that physical relationship with your own spouse, nobody else. He's speaking proverbially. I mean, we would expect that in the book of Proverbs, right? Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. The idea that some people would teach that it's okay to be a, a swinger, it's okay to share, have an open marriage where we share sexual partners, that is not scriptural or biblical. He says they should be only your own. They're not for strangers with you. It's becoming very common in our culture. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. How, am I, how are we rejoicing with the wife of our youth? As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times, always be enraptured with her love. Why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? Proverbs spends a lot of time encouraging a young man not to be seduced by a seductress or by an immoral woman, but to be committed to the marriage partner. Um, a healthy physical relationship is good. It's for pleasure. It's part of the rejoicing with our spouse. It is limited to marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, verses 2 through 4, Paul gets really specific. And I want you to notice he's getting specific with Christians who live in Corinth. Corinth was a very immoral city. They actually had sacred priestesses who were prostitutes who at night would go around and thought that they were worshiping their false gods by engaging in sexual relationships with others. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I think Paul's having to correct probably some of the false concepts that were coming into the church because Christians had converted from these different belief systems. And he makes it clear that because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. That doesn't leave any room for rendering affection to anyone outside of your marriage partner. He says, very specifically, husbands, give your wife the affection she needs, and that she is due, and the opposite is true as well. Wives, give your husband the affection that he needs and that he is due. You're going to have a lot less problems in marriage. The devil's not going to be entering into it if you've got a happy relationship on that level. Verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. The husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. In other words, you should listen to the counsel and the needs of your spouse when it comes to the sexual, sexual things. Don't deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. There are times you do need to back off that relationship, to fast, to pray, to grieve might be a situation. But he says, come together again so that Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. God wants happy marriages, and part of that, very clearly, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is having a healthy physical relationship. When we are willing to give of ourselves to one another, it's an expression of unselfishness. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says this in verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. In a word, that's just be unselfish. And that's certainly true in a marriage relationship. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The idea is that he put others first. And how important is it for us to put our spouse first? We read in scriptures that this physical relationship is to be interrupted by mutual agreement only for the purpose of fasting and prayer. So a healthy physical relationship is taught in scriptures. What's going to happen when we don't have that 
healthy physical relationship with one another. Well, sexual faithfulness, it's a key factor to the happiness of the marriage relationship. It's part of our vows. We promise to be faithful, loyal to one another. And it has to be maintained despite our displeasure. Because you're upset with your spouse, there's no reason to go out and cheat on them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8 says, This is the will of God, your sanctification. What, what's it mean to be sanctified? If you call yourself a saint, it means that you're sanctified. If you're someone who is a saint and you're trying to live a sanctified life, that is, you're set apart for God, here's one of the things he says you should do. You should abstain from sexual immorality. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. No one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified, God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. God wants us to be holy, set apart. And he who rejects this does not reject man, but God. You refuse to live a sanctified and pure and holy life, being sexually faithful to your spouse. He says, you're not rejecting man's teachings, you're rejecting God. It's God's will uh, that you be pure. Marital infidelity is going to breathe in unhappiness. God wants happy marriages. If you want to have an unhappy marriage, then here's one of the ways you can ruin that, and you can cause that, is be sexually unfaithful. It's going to grieve your spouse. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16 talks about the grief that it can cause to our spouse, how it does violence to our spouse. Marital infidelity is a bad example for our children. I certainly would not want to think about my son's wife cheating on him or my daughter's husband one day cheating on her. I know how bad that would hurt her. How bad it would hurt him. And I certainly don't want to set the example for them that that's okay in a marriage. There are a lot of people setting that example today for their kids where we're just sexually promiscuous. And we need to try to set a, a good example for our children, not being a stumbling block to them. Woe to those who are a stumbling block to the little ones, Matthew 18 says. The one reason that Jesus offers for divorce is sexual morality. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32 Matthew 5 and verse 32, there's a lot of reasons people get divorced in America because you can get divorced for any reason, but there's one reason God gives you for why you're allowed to, to end a marriage. It's not that you have to do it, but there's one reason why you have the right to do it scripturally, and it's sexual morality. Your spouse is sexually unfaithful. You have the right to put your spouse away, divorce them. Matthew 5.32 says, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. You get remarried to somebody who's been put away. Then you're an adulterer as well, scriptures teach. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Except for sexual morality. That's the one reason Jesus gives. Earlier he said, you should be joined together and, and no man should separate it. God's joined you together, don't separate your marriage. But then he says here that there's one reason you can put away your spouse. It's sexual morality. Infidelity can sever a marriage. And clearly in Scripture, infidelity and sexual morality, if it's not repented of, leads to eternal condemnation. Galatians 5.19 calls it a work of the flesh. Fornication, adultery, uncleanness, lewdness, all of those are in the category of sensual, sexual sins. And they're 
works of the flesh that lead to condemnation. Things that are happening outside of the marriage relationship. Infidelity's consequences are right here. It's not good consequences. This is not going to help you have a happy marriage. The reason why God warns about it constantly, Old Testament, New Testament, everywhere throughout Scripture, is because He wants you to have a happy marriage. And He's letting us know this will hurt your marriage partner and it will hurt your marriage. And it will take time to recover from. God bless you if you desire and try to reconcile a marriage after these difficult types of things have occurred in your marriage. But realize it's going to take time, to, a long time sometimes, to rebuild that trust and that relationship and to make your marriage what it ought to be. Proverbs says, don't go down that road in the first place. So you don't have to repair. Here's a third thing, though. A third thing that God encourages to help us to have happier marriage. And that is communication. The most common problems in marriage is ineffective communication. And God's Word can help with that, too. Uh, in marriage, our lives are no longer lived separately but they're lived in unison, okay? And that requires communication. I have to communicate with my wife. My wife has to communicate with me. And I can guarantee you, if I do not communicate well with her on an issue, she will let me know that I'm not communicating well because that's part of communication. You've got to communicate with each other. And there are hindrances to our communication. For one, you can be overcommitted. You've got too much going on. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16 says, To be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And it says to redeem the time, knowing that the days are evil. Use your time wisely. And it's possible that we can get so overcommitted to too many things that we're not using our time wisely. If our time is cutting into our uh, time that our spouse needs from us, that our children needs from us, then maybe we're overcommitted. We need to seek out to cut some things from our lives. We've got to learn to downsize our schedules and set priorities. And I want you to know that this is Christ-like. Mark chapter 1 and verse 32. Mark chapter 1 and verse 32. At evening when the sun had set, they brought to Jesus all who were sick, those who were demon-possessed. The whole city was gathered together at the door of Jesus. He healed many who were sick with various diseases. He cast out many demons. He didn't allow the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, notice, Jesus has been with people uh, late at night. He's probably tired, but notice what he does in verse 35 in the morning. Having risen a long while before daylight, he went out, departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. To me, that's one of the most beautiful pictures of Jesus. Tired, weary, hard to get away from the crowds when you're healing people and people want to hear your teaching. They're excited about it. Jesus finds some time to spend with his Father and he gets away from the crowd. And he just quietly and silently prays. He had to learn to set priorities. He had to learn to find time, make time to spend with God, to communicate with the Father. And we've got to do the same thing. We've got to find ways to cut things and to make time for our spouse and our lives. What are some other things that are going to hinder communication? Well, if you're unkind. If you offer unkind criticism to your spouse, that's going to hurt your communication because they aren't going to want to talk to you. If you're a jerk. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged. With what judgment you judge, you will be judged. If you're harsh towards your spouse, they're going to be harsh towards you. That's the principle here. If you're gracious and kind towards your spouse, they're going to be more likely to be gracious and kind towards you. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Verse 12 Here's the real principle. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Would I want my spouse to speak to me the way that I have just spoken to them? Would I want my spouse to call me the name that I have just called them? Would I like my spouse to lay their hands on me? 
and perhaps be violent with me the way that I have just laid my hands and been violent with them. Whatever you'd want them to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Treat other people the way that you want to be treated. And if you're not willing to do that, it's a hindrance to your communication in your marriage. It's going to hurt your marriage. Here's another thing that hurts marriage, though, and another hindrance to communication is when we're over-interested in material things. Proverbs 23, verse 4 says, Don't overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. Cease. Sometimes we get so interested in material things and making more money and having bigger houses and more cars and more stuff that we just work, 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 and we work ourselves to the point that we've worked ourselves out of a marriage because our marriage partner doesn't ever see us. And they're tired of feeling alone. They feel neglected. Because we're too interested in material things. Be careful not to let material things hinder the communication that's needed in your marriage relationship. Being over-interested in material things. Here's some things we can do to help enhance marriage, though. We kind of looked at some of the negatives, and we could probably look at a whole bunch of negatives. But here's some things you can do to help it. Keep a positive attitude. Positivity. Keep a positive attitude in your marriage. Look at some of the Proverbs. We're going to probably look at these when we study Proverbs coming up. In about a week, we're going to start studying Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Realize that, that you can hurt tremendously with your tongue, and you can heal tremendously with your tongue. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 4. There's a lot of Proverbs about the tongue. Proverbs 15 and verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Wholesome tongue. That's a healing tongue. It's another word that's used. Use your words to heal, to help, to edify, and to enhance, not to tear down. Proverbs 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Keep a positive attitude. Use, use your words wisely. Another thing that helps in communication, being positive, being a builder, being edifying, but also being a listener. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. You just need to listen. And sometimes that's all your spouse needs you to do. Just listen. James 1 and verse 19. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. If you're going to be a good communicator, communication is a two-way street. It involves a sender of the message, and it involves a receiver of the message. And you can't receive the message if you're always talking. My kids get taught this in school, right? Teachers ever say to you, you've got two ears and one mouth because God wanted you to do twice as much listening as you did talking. Be a good listener. Good listener. Be willing to listen. Proverbs 18 and verse 13. Here's another proverb we'll throw out there to make that point. Proverbs 18 and verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Be careful that you listen. Before you respond, before you smart off, before you think you have the answers, listen to what your spouse is saying. Show some tongue control. That's just the easiest way to put it. Control your tongue. Proverbs 21 and verse 23 says, Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Guard your mouth. Guard your tongue. So show some tongue control. Choose your words carefully. As you choose those words, be open with each other. Be honest. Look at some more Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 17. He who speaks truth... Declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Speak the truth. Be honest. Proverbs 12, verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Those who deal truthfully are His delight. Being dishonest and lying is not only an abomination to the Lord, but it's going to be pretty disappointing to your spouse. Tell the truth. Be open. Be transparent. Be honest with each other. Ephesians 4 and verse 25, the New Testament teaches the same thing. Put away lying. And let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. 
Be honest. Speak the truth. Here's one last thing when, when it comes to the tongue, but avoid nagging. Avoid nagging. Proverbs 21 and verse 9. Does anybody like to be nagged? When my kids nag me, and I have to use kid illustrations. I can't use wife illustrations on this sermon. That could get me in trouble. So I'm sure she has a lot of illustrations she could use on me. I would love to hear Jonna's version of this sermon, really. Wouldn't you? I think we should let her write it down sometime and share it with us. Um, she's not smiling. Um, <laughs> Proverbs 21 and verse 9. Better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Kids, what do I, what do I, Zoe, especially you, if you bug me to death about something, what's one of the things that we say to you? Keep on asking, are you going to get what you're asking for? No. No. <laughs> because the more you nag, the less likely I am to give in to you because you're driving me nuts. Better to dwell in a corner of a housetop, and there's a bunch of verses like that in Proverbs, than in a house share with a contentious woman, where you're always arguing, and always nagging, and always griping, and always stirring up a fight. Control your tongue. Don't be a nagger. Don't be a griper, a complainer. Try to avoid that. And then, when that happens, where you feel like you're being nagged, or you're being accused, or someone's complaining against you, Here's also what the book of Proverbs would encourage you to do in answering that. Proverbs 19, verse 11. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. The glory of a man is to overlook a transgression. Sometimes we just need to overlook a thing. Proverbs 15 says this, though. A soft answer turns away wrath. Soft answer. Not responding in anger with voices raised, yelling and screaming. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You respond to them in kind, you're going to brew up a pretty good fight. Verse 4, again, talks about the tongue. Wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Have that healing tongue, a soft answer to avoid a fight. Well, <clears throat> communication is necessary. Last point I'd make to you about a good marriage, at least last one that we'll talk about, is you've got to have good attitudes. Happy marriages require good attitudes. A forgiving attitude. If, if you can't forgive, don't get married. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. If you can't forgive somebody, don't get married. Ephesians 4 verse 32 says that we need to be kind to one another, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You're not perfect, and your marriage partner is not perfect either. You've got two imperfect people trying to work things out, and you've got to be willing to forgive. You've got to have a forgiving attitude. That's going to help your marriage, a good attitude, a willingness to forgive. You need to have an unselfish attitude. Philippians 2, we've already quoted it, but don't be selfish. You need to sometimes put others first and put what you want to do to the side for the sake of your spouse. There's been a lot of movies that my wife has watched because she is very unselfish. Movies that she would have never picked on her own to have watched. Um, documentaries about things that, that she wants to rip her eyeballs out <laughs> puts <laughs> and put earplugs into her ears because it bores her to tears but she's unselfish. And every once in a while, she lets me have my way. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of, a lot of chick flicks and movies that, and a lot of crime shows that I don't necessarily care to watch, but I've watched because my wife enjoys those things. You've got to have an unselfish attitude. Sometimes put the other person first. Have an encouraging attitude. Sometimes your spouse is going to get down in the dumps. They need you to be an encourager. Don't make it worse. Hebrews 3, verse 12, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Encourage one another daily. Don't you think that applies to your marriage too? We apply this all the time to Christians and brethren and how our, our brothers and sisters in the church need encouragement. That's true. But how much more true is it of the person that you live every single day with? They need your encouragement every day. Offer something encouraging, something building, to help them 
Have an encouraging attitude. It is no fun being married to somebody who's always tearing you down. Have an encouraging attitude if you want to have a good marriage. And have a trusting attitude. The husband of Proverbs, the Proverbs 31 woman, it says the heart of her husband safely trusts her. He was a man who trusted his wife. A suspicious attitude hurts marriage. It rules out trust. And worry is the enemy of trust. Have a good attitude. These are just a few things. We could talk about marriage forever and ever. And we've just spent seven lessons downstairs talking about a lot of those things. And we could have talked about it even more. But God needs to be a part of our marriage, spiritually. God needs to be helping us build a spiritual foundation physically. In our physical relationship, God, God gives advice and counsel on those lines. And we need to listen to it. When it comes to our attitudes, our, our expressions, our attitudes, how we treat one another, God wants to be a part of that, and He wants us to be having godly attitudes. And if we're going to let him guide us spiritually, physically, in our attitudes, we're going to find ourselves happier with each other because we're living a God-fearing, having a godly marriage. Keep in mind, though, it takes both couples working, well, both peoples, both individuals among the couple, both couples. I hope you don't have two couples in your marriage. You've got problems. It takes both people working to be what God wants them to be. And when that's the case, we're going to find ourselves being heirs together of the grace of life. And that's what God wants. God wants you to have a happy marriage. You know how it all starts? Well, first of all, you need to be a Christian. Someone who's given your life over to God. Willing to repent of your sins, because sin is going to cause a big problem in your marriage. Willing to turn your life over to Jesus Christ and follow in the ways of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't yet made that decision... We encourage you to make it. Believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Turn from your sins. Make the decision to be baptized into Jesus Christ, to start out as a new creature so that you can be a help to the world and most importantly to the most important person who you will ever share this world with, your marriage partner. If you want to make that decision, the choice is yours tonight. Just come forward while we stand and while we sing.